Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the latest edition of Lunchtime Learnings in the morning, obviously, at eight o'clock. I'm absolutely delighted and incredibly grateful to welcome Lara Morgan. Lara is an entrepreneur, an investor and a motivational speaker. I have the pleasure of meeting Lara at the Belvoir Conference um, in March. I thought Lara was absolutely exceptional, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I decided to take some action and go up to um, Lara, which is quite nerve wracking, I must admit. <laughs> um, not because of who you are, but getting out of my comfort zone and going in and, and seeing you and saying how um, how much I enjoyed the, the talk. And also, um, you know, we were kind enough if we could speak. And, and in fairness to you, you said, you know what, Stephen, I'm really busy at the moment but send me an email. And here's what I've really liked about you, Lara, and I'm gonna ask you in a minute to tell us a bit about your story. But what I really liked about you is you've made it a little bit hard for me to get you onto my podcast because you tried to make sure that I took action all the time. So there was a, right, Stephen, send me an email. So I sent you an email. Um, and then you were kind enough, I think your colleague Mandy um, gave me a call and said, right, Laura can give you some time, which I was incredibly grateful for. And we had a nice chat for 20 minutes. And then what was really interesting, you said, Stephen, can you follow up with an email with a funny story? So I'm thinking Laura is really testing me out here to see if I'm the sort of person that takes action and implements stuff. Um, and in fairness, I did. And Laura very quickly came back um, and said, yes, I would love to be a guest. So I found that fascinating. And maybe we'll talk about that in a sec. But tell us your story, Laura. Um, you know, yeah. how did you become an incredible entrepreneur? Um, you, I know you started a business at 23. I think you sold it um, 17 years later for 20 million, which is incredible. And I know you invest in loads of other companies. So incredibly grateful. I haven't slept all night because I've been that excited um, to, speak, to speak to you. So thank you for joining me. You're welcome. So, I mean, really, my story is uh, it's a very lucky story and i think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have their overshare of luck but we also make our luck by turning up like you did Stephen. so credit to you um and actually just before i forget to say it because i will forget when i met you i remember saying look i'm really busy i'm going to put a diary note and it's because i run everything i do for efficiency through my diary and I make notes to myself because if I make a promise to someone I want to deliver on the promise so I have Stephen Brown in my diary a few weeks ago and I I'm sure you got my email out of the sky blue and went oh my god she did yes. what she said she was going to do and it's really childish but I think unfortunately particularly when you say to someone because I think I even said look I'm going to be about three four months I'm pretty busy do you mind I know there's a gap coming up for summertime but because I'm disciplined about the hierarchy of value and no disrespect, um, and I want to put back into the world, I nevertheless have to say no more than yes. And so the hierarchy of value is created if you manage time to a level of efficiency that probably does make you feel a little bit mad and scared and uh, crazy. But actually, it works for me. So, you know, the diary pop up comes. It comes at six o'clock in the morning because that's my list of things that I want to do that day. And I get stuff done. So I email you and, and the rest is history. But I, you know, I had an extraordinary upbringing. I was born in Germany. I grew up in Hong Kong. I was educated in Scotland at a boarding school. So clearly my parents didn't like me. But I say that in the sense that, you know, what an extraordinary opportunity for a young person to travel literally halfway around the world to school. Boarding school is pretty tough. Um, you learn to be a bit agile, live on your wits, um, because you've got, you know, pocket money and nothing else. So you're already able to talk to strangers. We bring up our children and we say all the time, don't talk to strangers. But the truth is, is in those days, even if you just wanted to ask ask the time, you might have to ask someone the time. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, when I think back to sitting in train stations and bus stations. So, you know, I had this immense gift that we learned the flavor of life and we traveled halfway around the world for school. Then my dad went bankrupt. Um, ironically, I do see that as a gift. Um, 
because I started paying rent two weeks after my A-levels. That was not standard practice for a nice private school girl whose parents had just paid for her flights back to Hong Kong because she hadn't seen her parents for a year. So by then I was pretty independent and got a job because I had to start paying my parents rent. Actually, I wanted to be a golf pro. I was a pretty good golf. I went to school in St. Andrews anyway. Um, and I guess, you know, I learned selling because I could work it around trying to play golf. Um, and I, I just fell on my feet. I mean, I'm very proud to be a professional salesperson. And I always underline the fact that sales is a profession. It's not an embarrassment and it's not bloody business development either. You know, stop hiding around titles that aren't what they are. Right. We need to be bolder. And in Britain, we're rubbish at praising the salesperson. And by the way, <laughs> there is no business if there isn't a sell. And that's not an argument. That's a fact. Right. <laughs> right. If there isn't a sell, either online or some kind of sell, there is no business. So we need to be more professional about that. So I started selling, sold promotional giveaways, uh, riotous learning curve in Asia, trading umbrellas and keychains and God only knows what. And then sold Yellow Pages advertising in the Middle East, which wasn't my swiftest career move, but I was following a man to the Middle East. So it was my romantic side for want of a better description. <laughs> And in the end, I ended up in UK in the recession in 1991, 23 years old. There were no jobs. So I ridiculously, at a, at a point in 1991, where if you said you were an entrepreneur, which you wouldn't say because it was too embarrassing to say it, you know, a 23-year-old starting a company was like, and it was a bit out there, but there weren't any jobs, right? So I'd been offered a chance to sell genuinely sewing kits and shower caps and off the back of that for 17 years I expanded my competency in selling sewing kits and shower caps which is laughable because I turned it into a business that supplied what's called hotel amenities and when I sold that business now 14 years ago we were making 3.3 million EBITDA and at the time I sold it I was making more than Virgin Airways and I used to laugh about that because they were a customer but you know we're this minnow doing I don't know, nearly 20 million in turnover. Turnover's vanity is completely irrelevant. But the 3.3 million EBITDA is not irrelevant because everything is about the numbers and the profit line. So I learned that early. And then since then, I've been, I also by then had three small children. Uh, we took some time out and I was 99% shareholder when I exited. So that was actually another mistake I made in the process. I should have been better at creating a management pot. And from there, I've kind of looked around, made lots of other mistakes, thrown some money at the wall, lost some money, but have been building a kind of family office in health and wellness. So I have a number of investments that I think hopefully will add value to people's lives in terms of motivation, exercise. And the only thing you can't buy when you're rich is your health, right? I, you know, there's only so many body parts. I'll have to live a bit longer to get to the full Monty. I don't believe in cryotherapy either. So just for the record, I, you know, I'm looking after myself, but that's kind of, and I'm deeply passionate about people understanding that we're going to kill the NHS if we don't get our acts together. You know, obesity, uh, the diabetic problem that comes with overweightness is going to kill our ability to look after people that need real help that isn't self-inflicted greed. I'm sorry, but that's just a bold opinion that I believe. Yeah. Oh, there's loads there. Thank you. What a, what, a, what a story. I'm going to try and unpack a lot of the things that you said. I'm going to come back to some of the things. Um, talked about sales um, being a profession. So you've obviously um, worked with, interviewed, um, helped yeah, lo loads of top performers. What would you say are the qualities um, of being yeah, funnily enough, I was with John Caldwell at an event who's, I think, an unbelievable entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, born in Stoke-on-Trent, brought up on his uppers. And he said humility. No, he didn't say humility. And I thought he missed humility. So I would say humility first, because it doesn't matter who you are and how good you are. But he has humility in spades. He said resilience. I totally agree. And by the way, resilience is just a quality that you need because every day we get knockbacks and actually we're not good enough at teaching our children resilience. And, and 
sometimes putting barriers in the way so that they have to make their own way around them, I guess. I don't like the education system. It's a sausage machine that's cobblers. I mean, clearly leadership is a very broad title, but I've learned that leadership comes in all shapes and sizes. But I think teamwork of the leadership piece that you learn on the sports field is vital. Clearly, I'm passionate about lots of things, but sales I'm particularly passionate about. So I'm passionate about the quality of somebody who is passionately doing something purposefully, which is far more credible today that I'm building a business to employ people, which was the old way, right? We need to be much more conscious and clear about purposeful approach to business. I'm reading a really good book about the better type of businesses we can run with good out, you know, a good built in altruistic approach, which is, you know, the teamwork and bringing the culture with you. And I mean, ultimately, if you don't have a commercial mindset, you've got to do your numbers. And so it's not just the finances. And actually, that's what John made me think. It's it's that commercial savvy sometimes when you've got to have an all round outlook and understanding of commercial markets. I mean, at the moment, it is brutally tough for product companies, for anybody selling, frankly, a physical thing or service. It's it's, you know, and I mean, I met you at Belvoir at a time when housing was booming because everybody was trying to get out of London with their families and out of the cities into nicer homes. But I think the other thing that I would say about leadership is its integrity. And the reason I touch on that around the property market is I think it's one of those markets that has boom and bust, but it's those that maintain their integrity that will build reputation. And I think you touched on resilience and I think the state agents and letting agents are going to have to become very resilient. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about the recession when you first started. Well, there's going to be a lot of people that have come into the industry that aren't going to know what's going to hit them. Um, you know, they've had it very, very easy um, over the last two, three, four, five years. Um, interest rates have been incredibly low. Money's been incredibly cheap. Um, we haven't had Ukraine, the cost of living crisis. So again, for people that haven't experienced the recession, you know, what tips can you give um, and suggest to them? I can only suggest what I've been taught by others, but it's it's all very well. You made a statement earlier we were laughing about, because I, I have a statement on my website, which is about actions counting. And you said, I think it was something like, uh, it's about self-development, not shelf development, meaning people go, because when I go to events, I always challenge people. I say, look, there's absolutely no point turning up, stepping away from your business, pretending you're on your business for the day because you're very important. If you then don't take away a load of action things that, and by the way, you don't have to do all the doing, but you have to lead others to get those things done. And then you have to do a bit of sense check and hopefully you can add some more value because two brains are always better than one. Um, we look at things differently as human beings. But I think, uh, I mean, the, the best thing I learned was cut once and cut deep. And the earlier you cut, when you have a clear outlook that things are going to get tough, you save money early. And I mean, we, time and time again, businesses make this mistake. I probably have as well. But I saved my first company in 2000 and, well, I mean, I didn't really feel and, and be aware, right? The marketplace is huge. So the idea that we can't keep growing when there's a big market is not true. Um, so I think cut once and cut deep because September the 11th nearly killed me. I had to put my house on the line to the bank. It's hideous. Um, so if you don't back yourself as well, don't expect others to back you. Right. Um, other Other parts about what's coming up. More than ever, more than ever, service the customer like you've never serviced them before. And not just the current customer, but the other customer, the customer of the past who, you know, I think housing companies are appalling at using the stock of con connections that they have to grow their reputation. And I'm making this up, but I can honestly tell you the deeply average mailings that I get in my manor house given the fact that I'm living in a pretty cool manner, the deeply average 
follow up intention, having recently had the house valued because I just thought it would be quite amusing to see how much it's gone up. I, I did genuinely think, Jesus, that's maybe it's time I moved to a smaller place, but I can't help myself. Um, but, you know, there's a whole asset base that people could be using. Well, what are they doing? You know, what could you do to ignite really interesting conversations? And don't do it averagely, do it properly, right? Do it do it creatively, do it entertainingly. Um, and I think then sort of maybe the third thing is, do the line by line on your accounts. It's incredibly mundane and boring, but you may have app expenses, you may have overhead expenses that you just got a bit fat during fat times, a bit casual, right? Oh my God, you start saving the 80 quids. You save five of them this month, you got 400 quid, right? That rolls up into five grand. It all adds up. Exactly. So five grand on the bottom line, actually, what can I do with that five grand? What's a better way of promoting? So don't cut marketing. That's just crazy. Um, but actually also be different. Something I learned at Cranfield, business growth program, brilliant. You know, be different. And if you're, and also I say, it's really hard, but score your staff. Score your staff for the total agility and excellence that they bring your business. Are they good on the phone? Are they outgoing? Do they promote your company? Do they show passion? Do they turn up on time? Are they reliable? We, when we had to cut once and cut deep, had a theory that it was better to have all round agility and the attitude when we could teach the aptitude because culture was everything. And I cannot tell you how insightful it is when you start marking. Actually, do you know that lady in sales support? She's really good at bookkeeping. And we don't use that skill enough to enlighten the salespeople with this factual information. So information share and transparency, the openness. When you do your line by line, you then get into the right. So what other things should I be looking at? Well, I should be looking at my people. Are my people world class? Are they the Jim Collins good to great? Because if they're not, now is the time. You've got total ability, right, to sort this stuff out. I mean, there's always time to sort this stuff out. And then, of course, there's annoying things like maternity, which is totally unfair on small companies and pisses me off every day. <laughs> there you go. I'm allowed to say that because I'm a girl and I've had three children, but and I employ people that annoyingly get pregnant. Welcome to life, right? Okay, well, look, let's talk about that subject. You know, so females in business, females in the state agency. Um, you know, you said you've got three children. Um, how do you deal with that? You know, how there's a lot I'm of people. I'm a miserable mother. Um, <laughs> I'm useless. Uh, I've done the washing. I did all the wash. When I became a genuinely, I, I say this tongue in cheek, but a multimillionaire, it sounds really cool, but you know, it didn't, it took years to hit. I was still doing all the family's washing. <laughs> I wasn't doing the ironing. I've always refused to do the ironing. That's why I work hard. Cause if I can pay for a person who irons, then I'm good in life. Um, I'm pretty practical and down to earth and I set myself targets, but still doing all that stuff until they were 12, 13 years old. And I could have easily employed somebody a lot earlier, but demonstrating, uh, and by the way, this doesn't mean that my husband doesn't hang out the clothes as well. But the Team Morgan effect is they have to graft, right? They have to graft what they get, even as kids. So they have to wash the car. They have to earn their pocket money. They have to make their beds. The 18-year-old, of course, the last one is very slack, and I want to toast her at the moment, but she's in another country, so I can't. Um, they've all done local pub jobs. Friends of mine who are rich go, how have you managed that? And I'm like, it's not difficult. Don't hand the money on a plate and they'll go and get a job. You point the way, right? But I haven't gone and got the jobs. I've literally dropped them off and said, go into that pub and see if you can get a job. So they've all worked in local pubs, which is also really useful for bookings. Um, <laughs> and actually, I just think, you know, things like no weapons at the table. Oh, this is a weapon in my language, no, no mobile phones at the table, not allowed. So just basic stuff. Um, 
obviously trying to teach them the principles of good, good night's sleep and we're not by no means perfect and we've gone through some hell things and you know we've got the annoying artist middle child who just does her thing you know and we've got the older one that finally you know and the characteristics of children i and i think this totally relates to business study behavior understand is it a first child is it a second child the first child's going to follow all the room, rules they're going to fill in boxes academia mattered they wanted to show everybody else how clever they were and then Katie, my eldest, has realized that actually also you need to be happy in life. It's not about doing what other people want you to do. And it's never been me because I never went to university, which I tell all the children because they're like, oh, my God. Um, and I think we need to be more constructive about females being able to not have it all because it's rubbish to think that there's balance. Right. I've been utterly miserable at the time when my business is flying. I'm running really fast. I'm healthy and fit. My children don't know my name. I just happen to be in another country. It's a disaster. And then when I'm feeling fat and the business is really tough, I've probably just had a family holiday and I feel I've ticked that box and I'm rubbish at fight. And balance doesn't exist, Stephen, right? And we're too hard on ourselves, but women particularly, because we're shit at saying no. Uh, by default, Humanity has us picking up the elder generation in many cases because there's been a lack of fair balance at home. And if women want to step up and be in business, they're going to have to learn to say no and they're going to have to pick partners that also carry a fair uh, contribution to family life. So I think, you know, critically, I hope people listening look at themselves and go, do I? Because I think this generation is changing things. But interestingly enough, I had dinner with one of my staff who's on maternity yesterday. She's been lecturing one of her, her friends. And she's, you know, she's a good 20 years younger than I am about you can't do it all. So, you know, women are doing it to themselves. So the, that's also a bugbearer on investment, which is women have got to stop whinging about not getting investment when they don't bloody well ask. It's not rocket, you know, we've got to keep kissing the frog. And, ho and hopefully with what's going on with the lionesses and how well they're doing, yeah. that's yeah. going to that's gonna make a massive difference as well um, yeah. and start balancing it. And Wimbledon this year, I think for the first time, men and women got the same amount for winning the tournament, um, you know, which is, which is great to see um, happen. So thank, so thank you for that. I want to come back to actions and implementation, yeah. if I may. So there are people that are watching this, I know, who get up at 8 o'clock and are watching it on their way to work and listening, and there's quite a few of them. So you're, oh, obviously, you. uh, you're obviously a great coup, so thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining this morning and for saying hello, David, Angela, and Jim. Yeah, but, but actually on. credit to them, Stephen. If you turn up, stuff happens, right? Who knows? And it's those that turn up in life that, you know, the night when you really want to get home, but there's a flipping networking event, right? And you go to the networking event, you've got two choices. Pretend you need to speak to the coffee table or the drink table. Say to everybody, you've got a really important call, but actually you're saying goodnight to the children and you never really move the room. Or you turn up and I took a uh, I had a riot last week. I took a young guy to this event with John Caldwell. He was my work experience shadow. And I said to him, we've got some targets in the room. We're going to meet at least, you know, X number of people. We're going to move. I'm going to show you who to approach, how to approach them. When you need, made a mistake, how do you extract yourself? Always go for the threes because two people have eye contact, which leaves one as a spare um, to connect with. We should teach that in school. Never go to the twos in a networking room. But all of those actions... You know, we actually had to kiss five sets of frogs before we found someone really interesting to talk to. And this is a 17 year old bloke who's I also made action, everything he learned from a week's nightmare following me around like a bad smell, um, which is probably the wrong thing to refer to him. But if you don't have a sense of humor in life, why are you turning up? Um, and. I guess Harry learned more in that week. And I, I've had a lovely thank you note and thank you notes count, particularly if they turn up with chocolate. No, I'm joking. Um, I don't <laughs> eat more chocolate in my life. But I mean, What's actually... What's your favourite chocolate? No, no, you're not doing it, Stephen, and I'm never going to tell you, so please don't send me chocolate. I'd much rather, actually, 
that people went and did something for their mental health and invested in themselves. So if you really do feel you're getting takeaway, you know, go to my brand Centered, which is spelt with an S, and think about giving your staff a touch of corporate well-being, which should always start with a good night's sleep, always, because when we sleep well, we perform better. So anyway, um, in terms of actions, you know, First of all, start with technology. Like I said at the beginning, use your phone. It's got a diary in it. Use your diary. Get organized. I think the early bird catches the worm, but I also know that my marketeers and my, you know, those flipping creatives, like, they start later. So, you, you know, just be aware that different people have different mindsets, different approaches, different ability to be performers at different cadences. So also recognize your own cadence. Um. I'm a list writer, but I also use technology. So my notes are on my phone. This morning when we started talking, I wrote down the notes that I took when I was listening to John Caldwell. And I'm constantly trying to learn because with those learnings, I then apply those learnings and I'm not doing what you call shelf development, which I loved. Um, but also I'm capturing in my network actions. I'll give you a perfect example. Lots of people on this call will know the brand Bulldog the uh, shaving brand, you may be familiar with it. Men men have a 47 second dwell time at the shaving counter. So Simon Duffy, who ran Swats Bulldog, had 47 seconds for you to come off Gillette. It's not a lot, right? And we met a while ago and, you know, he was in his journey. I was, frankly, I had a head start because I was 23 when I started and he's ex-Coca-Cola. He's much smarter than I am. But I really liked him and I we had a conversation, we had a meeting, and it was regarding opportunities that we could exchange. But I put his number on my phone. And this is the power of technology. Last week, I read that he'd taken a non-exec job with another brand. And I thought, I wonder what Simon's doing now. I've heard he's exited Bulldog. So I texted him. We've since had a conversation. There's an opportunity because he was in my phone. So how many people do you not put in your phone or not collect your data when actually one day that network saves you weeks of work trying to connect with someone, which is getting harder and harder and harder. You know that bit about what you should do now? Look at your data. Look at past data, look at current data, and look what future data you want, because data is power. Well, that is my um, that is my favorite subject. That is one of the, <laughs> that is one of the things I, I teach. So um, there's right. gold in that. There's gold in that data. And actually, oh. you know what? You you hit the nail on the head before. You know, I know we had this discussion a week or so ago about um, how many times you had a call, physical for a call from the agent that you bought the property, and it was never. And you had gone in witness protection, and you were kind enough to give them a call to get them to come round um as well but there's plenty of agents out there that were in fact i know 95 percent of agents have no in stay in touch policy and actually there's a few people watching this and they're starting their own business and they say well what do i need to do and the first thing i say is get your phone go through every single contact in your phone and tell them i've got some really exciting news i'm becoming an estate agent who do you know friends family colleagues or neighbors that are next looking to sell that i can help and you'll I mean, be amazed at the reaction that you get. I think also this market's going to get more competitive because it's been easy money for a long time. And I mean, I literally at the dinner I was at last night, a girlfriend of my, hopefully a member of staff returning, um, not allowed to ask, but she pretty much early declared because we have a great culture. So I'm chuffed to bits. It makes me feel I can't wait to have her back. But she mentioned to me, I've got two friends. One's left Savills and one's left not, um, Strutton Parker. And they've set up a new kind of uh, property sales company where there's much more value in sharing with the customer the local proper local school information, proper transport information, as in not it's 21 minutes and you're lying to get to the station. But actually, you know, how difficult is it to park at Salisbury Station? It's a bloody nightmare, or it used to be, probably isn't now, except on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. But my point is this, which is whatever you're doing, you can be more creative and inventive and it shouldn't cost you money and engagement, that gold dust. So clearly I want to sell anybody anything, but, you know, imagine an estate agent that wrote 
after three months and said, I just thought I'd drop you a note to say, I hope that house is the house of your dreams. And it was an original letter and it was authentic. And you, I mean, actually we have somebody who uses our candles. What do you call that thing where they complete? Um, a, completion. A, kind of completion, a completion gift. We were talking about it earlier. I didn't know that's what it was called, but you know, instead of sending something almost, I don't mean to be crass, but I don't want champagne and chocolates. All my friends are giving me house moving presents, but, and, and I'm not necessarily, a, a thank you is nice and a, and a handwritten card, but how about giving a toss a bit later, showing that you were authentic about selling me the house. So those are the things where the passion and the care and the pride in what you do really builds a reputation and a brand. And today, the point of difference is we can do lots the same and technology is going to make us all super efficient, but it's the reputation and the brand, the personalization that people talk about. But what does that actually mean? Right. So that yeah. matters. So it's the tiny noticeable things. It's the little oh, things yeah. that makes you stand out, makes you different, makes, makes people remember you. So just on that point, on how do people get hold of all this, the candles and the well-being and the health so, stuff? So, yes, of course. And, and, I, and in fact, I'm going to unashamedly, because we shouldn't be ashamed of making a couple of other plugs, but I've got a, an amazing outdoor well-being brand called Kit Bricks, K-I-T-B-R-I-X.com. And we need more kids playing outside. So I passionately back Kit Bricks because it has a brilliant poncho, which is like a change robe, but it's under a hundred quid, not 160 quid, like the, the change robes of dry robe, which I used to own shares in. And I am not knocking them because it's a brilliant product, but 160 quid for a kid. No, I'm not doing that. I'm far too Scottish. Um, <laughs> Yogi Bear. I mean, you know, today, so Yogi, Y-O-G-I hyphen B-A-R-E, Yoga has flown, and, and I mean, literally, they are like magic carpets. But, you know, you could even give, if you really knew your customer and they've moved into a new house and they've moved in there because they wanted more space, instead of giving them a bottle of champagne, give them a flipping yoga mat that they practice on because the champagne bottle's going in the bin and it's somebody else's brand, it's not yours, and it's unmemorable, it's unimaginative, and it's not health, it's not really authentic. It's just tick that box. You know, anybody can, that person can buy a bottle of champagne or a bottle of wine anywhere they like. Um, and then obviously centered because I, I know that the anxiety and the damage that we've done during lockdown, which by the way, you know, estate agents have massively uh, gained from, but we've got this appalling situation where anxiety difficulty there are some people who simply haven't come out yet right that's a nightmare we've got mental health issues and centered whilst it's a uh 100 natural aromatherapy brand is literally just a portable balm that you put on your pulse points and it's been my hardest enterprise journey and maybe it's useful for people to know that it isn't all a flipping um I, I, I'm, I've now found the silver lining, but it's taken a lot of money, more sleepless nights than I'd like to imagine, even though Sleepwell is a brilliant product. It, I'll tell you what, you know, losing all your business going into COVID, the, the hurt that some, you know, we all our supply company into spa and hospitality closed. So Scented is a mindful well-being range and it changes lives because ultimately my mum says I'm selling stock, um, fresh air, stop, inhale and reset. And actually, if we could just breathe more consciously, but we underpin it with scent, we actually change mindset. So I've got kids with focus balms in a pencil case, but I've got mums using, you know, the love balm because it actually makes them feel better during menopause, you know, and, and there is nothing better than sleep well or de-stress. They are obviously, and sadly, you know, de-stress sales have gone up because we know but, you know, running a business, you have to look after your mental health. And I will admit that I have never been lower in my life than during COVID. And I've never been busier. I've never worked harder. So irrespective of any product stuff, give yourself a break, right? If you haven't noticed, 
everybody in Britain now switches off in the last two weeks of August. They seem to just disappear like the French. And therefore plan in a break because nobody's going to email you anyway, but maybe plan in some on the business time after a break and don't just delve back into that old poor action habit where you just churn emails, right? There's a brilliant book people should read called Eat That Frog, which is, you know, doing the one flipping, you know, when we had in-trays in the old days. Brian Tracy. Yeah, exactly. Eat, is, I mean, it's flipping brilliant. And I used to read all those one-minute managers. And I'm constant. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm reading educational stuff I, laughably. I mean, look at this. I don't know if you can see it in the background. My, that's nothing. I've got about... I don't know, God only, I've, most of WH Smith's business, all of WH Smith's business section. So the other thing is, is give yourself a break, but always be learning. You know, that's the action and then apply it. Right. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions because I'm incredibly grateful for your time. And I know you've got loads of other things um, to do today. So you talked about going meeting um, networking events. Um, and there's a lot of people that feel very uncomfortable going and, start, and starting a conversation. And again, one of the things we were discussing this yesterday and talking about the easiest way to get your name out there is video. Um, and, you know, you can reach 10,000 people in an hour, um, but people won't get behind the camera. They won't do what we're doing now. They won't go and have a conversation with somebody. And I must admit, you know, the story that I sent you, you know, I was that person, you know, yeah. I'm incredibly shy, wouldn't say boo to a goose if I was to go and speak to somebody. And you know, look, I've, I'll share with people a quick story here. You know, a lot of people know my partner passed away, sadly, last year. And we were together for um, 30, 30 years. Um, I miss her terribly. Um, I decided after uh, a year that I thought I was ready to go back and meet somebody. Somebody gave me a number and I cannot tell you, it was, it was a nightmare. I called and I was pouring with sweat. I was hyperventilating. It was, it was horrendous because I hadn't done it for so long. So I know it's slightly different, but, ha and I did it and I did it. The thing was, she didn't know who my who I was, but that was another story. But I did it. But how do people make take that first step? How do they become uncomfortable? No, um, I mean, funnily enough, in Harry's notes, you know, the young guy I talked about who was my yes. shadow last week. He said he let one of the things he he wrote to me is he said, You seek discomfort. Right? And I thought that's pretty, that's pretty cool way of describing it. So I have a personal challenge, which is. And by the way, you can always wear black trousers or a dark skirt because then people won't see your sweaty knickers because it's scary. <laughs> and that's a that's my human fear. Right. So I talk about sweaty knickered moments and there's nothing wrong with sweaty knickered moments because nobody can see them. And your heart's racing. And I say to young people, particularly kids, you know, you've got to go out and do uncomfortable things, whether it's serving in McDonald's or learning to be a plumber or a plumber's assistant, you've got to go and do uncomfortable things. And then you start becoming an uncomfortable executive. And if you ever stop being an uncomfortable executive, then actually you don't deserve a pay rise. So for me, you've just, there's, you've just got to have mechanisms. So I, I, you know, I've built in ridiculous things like confidence boosters of a routine before I go and do something. And, um, challenges for when I'm in a networking environment as to how many people I can meet and when I you know if I'm really you know fed up of it I'll just set a target make sure I've met 10 really different people and then go home and put the beds kids to bed you know it's a prioritization thing but I still turned up so I think sort of other you know getting outside your comfort zones you've all been on zoom so the idea that you can't be on a picture What's the difference between recording the video and having this conversation and having a conversation that you then put out there? And if you've really got experience and you have an opinion, what's what's the worst thing that can happen? There's 7.2 billion people in the world. They're not all going to disagree. Right. So, you know, the ridiculousness that we are worried about what people think and say of us is something that that's back to the resilience card. 
if you want to go places, you have to be uncomfortable a bit. And you have to deal with things going tits up or off the plan because there isn't a business in the world that follows the plan and delivers the plan. There just isn't, right? Um, Facebook had its, you know, worst year last year. And I'm laughing because it still makes millions and millions of dollars. But what I think is, is that, you know, you are your own driver. It is your choice to run a business. In making that choice, you're going to have to do uncomfortable things. You're going to have to lead by example. You don't have to be anything, but if you want to go places, you have to do uncomfortable things. Look forward, learn from whether it went well or whether it went badly. Like you said, you called that lady. She didn't know who you are. I mean, the new dating game just mystifies me. I've been trying to understand the teenage language of dating. It's impossible. Um, my, I have three daughters out in the real world and it's just entertaining. I, I just think, you know, making our children uncomfortable and saying to them, could you go and ask the directions or handing them the passports at the, I think it's a great story, actually, um, very briefly. All our lives, we've handed the kids, one of the children, the passports and said, you check in, you get us to the gate on time. I think we've only missed a plane once and it was my fault. We were buying ice cream. <laughs> but I had a text from my youngest 18 year old who flew to Madeira recently. And at sort of, you know, 7.48 in the morning, I got the text saying, nailed the passport process. Gatwick's a flow. Um, I never even thought about or was concerned about her going to the airport, checking in. I didn't drop her off. She got public transport. Um, and that's the gift of putting people in uncomfortable situations from being early. So I think that's probably the most valuable thing I've shared, Stephen. You know, do it for your kids if you can't do it for yourself. But also do it for yourself because you shouldn't be doing asking your kids to doing something you would shouldn't do in a discomfortable way and in an uncomfortable way, rather. Thank you. Well, look, um, Sarah Edmondson, um, who is absolutely exceptional person, um, we were talking about well-being before, and I'm part of a foundation where Sarah is the chairperson, um, and it's well-being of estate agents. And we started two years ago. Cool. Um, we have got 350 mentors that give up time. We've menteed, I think now Sarah, Sarah's going to put me, but over 600 people. We've given over 15,000 free hours of um, stuff which is absolutely incredible. And I think maybe you and Sarah should speak about all this sleep well stuff as well. So Sarah, meet Lara, Lara, meet Sarah. Nice um, to meet you. I'm sure, I'm sure there's something you can do. So Sarah says, for me, it's rec recognizing the magnitude of small achievements, acknowledging and building upon small wins or small adversity. Absolutely. Over, basically being comp compassionate um, towards yourself. Then use that and remind yourself of that every time you find yourself in a difficult situation that requires confidence. Uh, that, so. That's a much better answer than I had. And I mean, but it is incremental, right? You, you're not going to get it right overnight. And it, and by the way, for those people that are listening that are thinking, oh, one day I'm going to nail networking. One day I'm not going to feel like shredded when I go into a room of strangers. One day I'm not going to have sweating. It's never going to happen, right? I'm terrified a lot of the time for stuff that I try and do. And I still... You know, I love, I, I, I get, you know, if I don't, if I don't really have that energy burst of feeling a bit scared about needing to deliver for people when I'm speaking publicly and being paid and whether or not I'm paid, I need to feel that I'm, I'm giving people something that is actionable, valuable, or else I'm not achieving my life goal. Right. So the other thing that I would say, in addition to the excellent things that Sarah said is, you also have to have your own plan and try and stick to it. And that's not difficult because that's not easy because life gets in the way. There will be difficulties. You will make sacrifices. But you've got to decide what are the drop dead things that you're not going to sacrifice. Like I never missed a school sports day. That was important to me. I don't, you know, you decide what's right for you. Yeah, and then Jim says, and again, Jim's near you from St. St. Andrews, got a great business there, does an amazing amount for the community. It's all about learning to love the journey, master that, and nothing can stop you. And then Jim says, I'll go to the opening of an envelope if it further my cause. 
I, um, my mother talks about that and I agree entirely. But I mean, be strategic because you might have a couple of envelopes and you might want to prioritise the order. OK, so I've absolutely loved this morning. I'm so grateful. I could carry on all day, but I know you've got other stuff to go on to. One final question. You mentioned um, Brian Tracy, Eat That Frog. You mentioned another book, which I don't think I got the title for. Oh, you have to write it down. Jim, J-I-M, Collins. OK, C -O -L -L. good to write. Good yeah. to write. I've read I mean, that. I've, I've read it more than once, and... It refers back to the get A players on your bus and also be clear about the cultural direction you want to go in. And by the way, it's much better to employ A players that are better at stuff that you don't like doing. So I am surrounded by people and it's a long list of stuff I'm rubbish at. So um, I like selling. Be proud of selling. Okay, brilliant. I am so grateful that Not you've given all. us your time. Um, and... It's been incredibly valuable, loads and loads of life lessons, not just sales lessons. So thank you so much. Um, again, if people want to get hold of you. No, they can also go to the laramorgan.co.uk website, which is probably out of date because it. I'm very busy trying to rescue stuff like luggage supply companies, Gate 8, it's one of my other investments, and it's been really hard in the travel industry. And it's not been perfect and it isn't perfect. And we shouldn't be afraid of saying I failed in some areas, right? I mean, I'm cash flow nightmare at the moment. Do what you can do. Be honest with your customer. Have honest conversations with your suppliers. But prepare early for what's going to be a very tough period, I think. And it's it's a nightmare because we've already suffered. And some of us have felt like punch bags. And I think there's people out there that need a flipping break and they're not going to get one so I, I i would like to remain positive so i'll leave on a positive note which is it's a big world right if you're in enterprise perhaps look wider or look more creatively because there's always newness that the human can create to be better and different and then you will grow perfect way to end Lara, thank you so much. All the, com all the comments coming through are just unbelievable. So many great comments. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for um, watching and listening today. I'm going to put it live on all the socials. So please share it um, and share all about Lara's businesses. So some great stuff there to help her as well. Yeah, buy my thank product, for God's sake, please. <laughs> there you go. Big enough plug, Lara. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to speak to you. Thank you all. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.